Hi, everyone. Welcome today to our webinar. My name is Marina Amini. I'm the executive director for CVC. And um, Manar Hijaz is our facilitator today. She is joining us as part of our spring webinar series for CVC at One. Uh, we're so happy to have you on this topic. It's such an important topic for regular substantive interaction. I want to take a few moments just to do a quick introduction of your facilitator, Manar Hijaz. Um, she is a full-time tenured faculty member at Chafee College. She currently oversees one of Chafee's success centers where she helps to develop initiatives around student achievement, success, and completion. She's also the educational service coordinator for success centers, supplemental instruction, peer assistance, and she does all things online in terms of developing content, activities, and assignments. Um, and she is really dedicated and committed to equity through mentorship and workshops and inclusive educational landscapes. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce her. And um, just as a quick reminder, I will be dropping a survey in chat. So please keep an eye out for that. And um, I'll probably be doing that about halfway through and then regularly every 15 minutes or so. We really would love your feedback in terms of the topics that we cover so that we can continue to improve our webinars. And if you need any kind of verification for attending this webinar as part of your PD or flex hours, what you can do is complete that survey and then there's a button to click for uh, getting a copy emailed to you as verification. And we ask that you use that survey receipt as your verification if you need it. But if you forget that, or if you didn't do it, just shoot us an email at cvc at support at cvc.edu and we will go ahead and help you out that way as well. Okay, thank you. And with that, I will hand off to Manar. Manar, welcome. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. Today's webinar is titled The Art of Connection, Building Effective Regular Substantive Interaction. So uh, as uh, Marina mentioned, my name is Manar Hijaz. I'm an Instructional Specialist Faculty and Coordinator at Chafee College. And like many of you, I've become interested in distance education and improving online offerings and resources for students during the pandemic. Um, I think that was a time a lot of us really started to recognize the educational disparities that exist. Um, at Chafee specifically, we had a lot of data showing that during the pandemic, um, we were losing a lot of our um, black and brown male students of color. And so I think this really pushed me and a lot of my colleagues to reflect on what we do as educators and what we can do better, because clearly we were doing something wrong, to help ensure that no student is left behind. And I think um, improving distance education is one way to, to, to help close the gap. And um, you know, I just really appreciate you all being here in this environment because it, it helps me learn and I'm hoping that you are able to learn something as well. All right, so some of you have already uh, mentioned your name. I just thought we can start off with some introductions. And you mentioned the, the college that you work at. If you did, then you know no need to repeat that. Um, and then I also want you to um, answer the following question. What is one of the most difficult things about either teaching or taking an online class? So some of you might be new to the distance um, educational uh, environment, and maybe you haven't taught an online class yet, um, but you plan on it. Um, and then maybe you've taken an online class either as a student or just to develop yourself professionally. So um, e either one works. Um, just take a few moments to um, answer in the chat um, and I'll just give you guys some time to do that. Student engagement seems to be a top one. Managing course findings, different ways to support students. Very personalized, detailed feedback, a big part of RSI. We're gonna talk about that. Creating community, absolutely, that's, that's a difficult one. another student engagement. Teaching multiple classes, getting them to Zoom office hours. 
keeping students involved. Finding ways to connect with students. Hopefully you'll you'll get some, you know, feedback and strategies um, by the end of this webinar for that. Not being able to read the room. The front load of creating the media. Yeah, that's a lot of work. Engaging students. I'm seeing a lot of like engaging uh, uh, students. All right, keep those responses coming. Um, I think a lot of you have, you know, some of the challenges you have, you're sharing in common. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to talk about different strategies that you can utilize that will help mitigate some of those uh, difficulties. All right, so just a little quick agenda of what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, we're gonna start out by defining um, RSI. We're gonna talk about the importance, why it should matter to you. We're gonna talk about RSI and equity. Uh, we're gonna go into the major elements of RSI. We're gonna talk about student initiated contact, student to student interaction, um, and then strategies to foster uh, RSI and meaningful interaction. And then lastly, we're going to talk about new Canvas analytics. Um, if you're teaching online classes, you may be uh, already using it, um, but how to utilize the Canvas analytics to enhance RSI. All right. So many of you, whether you're teaching online courses or not, have probably heard of this idea of regular substantive interaction. And for some of you, and you know, I was one of those individuals, I was really frustrated at the lack of clarity of what really constitutes RSI. Um, so in distance education, regular and substantive interaction is the requirement that online courses have to provide meaningful engagement between students and instructors. So the requirement is there, but it's not always cl clearly defined. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, I'm hoping this webinar will, will kind of help fill in some of those uh, knowledge gaps around it. So the Regular in RSI implies that interactions have to occur with predictable frequency. So students should receive ongoing support and guidance throughout the course. Um, and this can involve like a lot of different things. You can have scheduled virtual class sessions, um, discussion forums, office hours, or any other types of means of communication that occur at like defined intervals. And then the substantive aspect of RSI means that the interaction um, is meaningful and it contributes to the learning process. So it's not just any interaction that you're having with students, it has to contribute to the learning process and be about the course and enhanced course competency. Um, so it, it goes beyond just administrative tasks or superficial communication. And although it's not to discourage you, you know, sometimes just having like topics that don't really, um, enhance the class or enhance learning for the class is fun for students and that might encourage engagement in other areas, but this is just like the basic uh, requirement. Um, so, you know, including things like meaningful discussions, specific feedback um, on activities, and some of you mentioned in the chat that that was like, that could be a challenge and I absolutely agree. Um, supporting students, um, how to support students and then understanding like, you know, the progress in the course. So RSR, um, RSI requirements are in place to ensure that distance education programs have the same um, quality uh, and academic rigor as a traditional face-to-face -face course. Um, so students should receive adequate support and engagement from their instructor, even if they're you know, physically separated as they would be in an online course. So um, as an instructor, if you're teaching an online course or you plan to teach, you should be thinking about um, how to, interact meaningfully with your students and how to create opportunities for them to interact meaningfully with one another. So it's it's kind of a two-parter and we're going to talk a, a little bit more about that um, in a little bit. So to kind of summarize some of what I've just touched on, um, RSI has to be initiated by the instructor. Okay. It has to be academic in nature and relevant to the course. But like I mentioned, you could also include things that aren't, um, you know, academic in nature or relevant to the course that might enhance like involvement um, and encourage them to participate in other areas. 
And then it also has to be scheduled, predictable, and frequent. So, you know, you don't want to just drop like an announcement a few times in the semester. This is something that should be happening on a regular basis. So why is RSI important? I mean, ba on the basic level, it's a requirement. Um, the Accrediting Commission for Community and Junior Colleges, as well as the U.S. Department of Education, requires that all courses um, and online courses involve regular and substantive interaction between students and instructors. The other thing is that it's a key element that distinguishes the uh, difference between distance education from correspondence education. So as many of you know, and if you've taken a correspondence structure type educational course, it's usually where instructional materials are sent to you or you're able to like download them um, and you're physically distant from the instructor, the interaction really doesn't happen often. It's very infrequent. And when it does happen, it's typically, um, you know, the student reaching out um, to the instructor, maybe about a question um, in terms of like requirements or whatnot. Um, whereas uh, with RSI, it's a lot more meaningful interaction. It, it isn't just like, you know, you're grading assignments without providing any feedback. You're attaching like opportunities for discussion with reading and, and um, like lectures. Um, and just a lot more intentional about how you encourage students to interact with you, you interact with students and you encourage students to interact with one another. So beyond uh, the you know, requirement expectation, why should RSI matter to you? Um, it's, it's a crucial part of uh, education for a few different reasons. First, it fosters a deeper understanding of the subject matter. So when students are regularly engaging with the instructor, um, they're typically seeking clarification, they're asking questions, they're discussing um, concepts that might be difficult to them, um, they're receiving feedback. Um, and, and this uh, interactive process really promotes active learning and it helps students grasp the material more effectively. The, the other reason is, um, you know, meaningful interaction really helps enhance uh, learning experiences by providing a sense of connection and support. And a lot of you talked about that in the chat, that, that that could be a challenge, right? In an online course, kind of creating that connection um, and, and ensuring that students don't feel isolated. So students are more likely to stay motivated and feel a sense of belonging when they have consistent and substantive exchange with their instructors. And this type of um, interpersonal um, uh, you know, aspect really contributes to their positive learning environment. And I think um, you know, a lot of research shows that this connection ensures that students ensures student success and retention. And so, you know, it's it's not just about, okay, you're meeting a requirement, it really helps enhance success among your students. And then another thing that I think is probably even more important than what I just mentioned is that RSI really helps to enhance equity. So I mentioned just now that research shows that, um, you know, RSI between instructor and student and online classes significantly increases student success. And this is, I think, especially important for students of color um, in California, since we know that success gaps between students of color and white students continue to exist. It also helps to humanize the online learning experience. And this is an equity issue for students who are unable to take in-person classes. Um, at Chafee, we conducted a, a survey fairly recently regarding like online classes. And a lot of our students shared that they take online courses because um, it provides like work-life balance. Some of them talked about the fact that their parents um, or they work full-time, so they can't take in-person classes. Um, some of them spoke about like lack of transportation. Um, so online courses uh, were an appropriate option for them. So like Chafee students, a lot of your students often have to take online courses. So ensuring that they receive the same level of education and experience as a student taking an in-person class is really crucial. Like we don't want them feeling like because they're taking an online class, their experience with learning is lesser, they're less cared about. So it, you, you really have to be intentional about design. Um, and then 
just generally uh, RSI guarantees that students receive the benefit of the instructor's presence in the learning environment, both as um, someone who's providing um, instructional information and someone who's facilitating student learning. And then it also helps to eliminate the feeling of psychological isolation that a lot of students feel when taking online classes and it often leads them to dropping out. I actually, so I only took one online class in college and it, it was the probably the only class I really struggled to pass. Um, and it wasn't even because the, the content was like difficult. I just really, that feeling of isolation, the lack of engagement, uh, you know, of course this was, pre-RSI requirements. So, you know, I, I would imagine that if I took that same course now, my, my experience might be a little bit different. Um, but just to kind of highlight like that feeling of isolation, the lack of interaction and oversight just made it a, like a really big challenge for myself. And so I think this is something that a lot of our students often experience when they're taking online classes, even if you're meeting all the requirements. Um, it's different than being in person and like having a conversation with somebody. So we have to be really intentional and proactive about ensuring that they don't feel isolated and alone in that online environment. All right, so to meet federal standards um, of substantive, online educators must engage in at least two of the following forms of interaction. One, assessing or providing feedback on students' coursework. And this feedback should be like, you know, it shouldn't just be like automatic feedback, good job. It should be very individualized. It should be specific. It should go beyond like automatically graded quizzes and exams, not to say that that can't be included in the course as well. Um, it should provide like clear instructions on assignments and the feedback should happen often and it should be very specific to the student that you're providing the feedback to. Um, the second one is providing information or responding to questions about the content of the course. And this is detailed information. You want to respond in a timely manner, especially about inquiries the students are making um, and provide like detailed comments on course content. Uh, the third one is facilitating group discussions about course content or competency. Um, so you not only want to post a discussion board, but you also want to participate in them. So you're, you know, you can do that by posting replies um, to the student work, adding comments, asking questions to further student thinking. Um, and then providing feedback on discussions um, in a private way to individualized students or providing it to the whole class, um, you know, like highlighting particular posts in the discussion um, board or, or messaging the whole class about uh, specific discussions. Um, and then providing direct instruction. So you may have like synchronous um, uh, teaching sessions. And the last one, just other instructional activities, but it has to be approved by uh, your institution's accrediting agency. All right, so there are two major elements um, of RSI. There's the instructor to student um, interaction, um, and then there's the student to student interaction. So instructor to student interaction, um, ensuring regular substantive instructor to student interaction guarantees that students will receive your presence in the learning environment. Um, so in a face-to-face -face instructional format, you're, you're obviously physically present, right? You're attending class. Um, students are talking to you. If you're having discussions that that's occurring in class, there's lectures, there's activities. Um, in a course section that is, uh, you know, in part or whole through distance education, you have to be more intentional about creating that ex experience that's equivalent to the face-to-face. -face. And then the student-to-student -student interaction is also a key feature of distance education. Um, and these forms of contact are required by uh, federal regulatory requirements um, and the ACCJC. Um, so educators have to ensure that they're building space in the course that creates student to student interaction. And it's not just you interacting with the students. Um, and we're gonna talk about ways that you can do that. Hey Menar, there's a couple of quick questions. Um, one is from Dan Barnett. Dan, do you wanna go ahead and paraphrase your question for her? Cause I think you had a two part question. I wanna make sure I get it right. 
I think you should be able to unmute yourself and ask that question. Okay, here we go. Um, uh, first part is uh, thinking about how to test this. If an instructor had some kind of direct teaching, and I don't know whether that means it has to be synchronous, and no other uh, connection with students as, as far as interaction, except having office hours online and nobody ever comes. And so it, is there a way, obviously no one would do this maybe, but is there a way uh, uh, to to say, no, no, those that's, that's not allowed. Second thing is I understand that the federal concern is just instructor to student interaction and it would be ACC JC who would add on the student to student interaction. So is there a difference? Uh, you're correct in your second question um, that the ACCGC adds on that requirement. And since okay. it's to, to receive accreditation, then you're you would be required to do it. I don't know if I understood your first question, though. Can you? Yeah. I, first I first sure. question is someone who wants to uh, an instructor who wants to game the system to do as little as possible to say, oh, office hours. Well, I'll have uh, online office hours. No one ever shows up. But that counts as RSI, doesn't it? And it, do, it, it does, I, I, you know, assuming that they have incorporated, uh, you know, office hours in that class. But part of RSI, you know, just giving that example, would be creating things within the course that encourage students to come to office hours. Okay. So, and again, it, sometimes you might do everything in your power and they're still not coming. Um, but if you're finding that students aren't coming, you might think about other things that you do, like in terms of announcements or reminders to let them know that you have office hours. Um, I know some instructors who would either, either like even offer like, you know, some tips for exams that will only be offered if you meet with me at a certain time and things like that to really encourage participation. And then also there's, you know, it that's only one element, right? So like, even if that you're you're trying to sneak the system or whatever that that's only one thing not that we would not that we would <laughs> yeah we always have yeah. the best of uh you know the, the best intentions right we always yes. have the best intentions um and then there's another question as well Menor, which you might handle later but jennifer uh is asking can you give some examples of other instructional activities approved by accrediting agencies so i don't know if that's on your deck that you'll get to later but she was interested in some more examples. And then Allison also provided some great examples that she does in chat as well. Yeah, um, I'm going to be sharing some like rubrics and things from both Chafee and other places that might give some more examples of that. And thanks for handling the uh, questions because I'm sorry, I have like three different screens up and like a lot of little boxes. So I'm not exactly looking at chat right now. <laughs> um, so keep those questions coming. All right, so we're going to do a group activity. Um, I know a lot of times in webinars, it's just somebody speaking at you the whole time, but I find that to be like a little bit, you know, tedious and just boring for attendees. So I am going to break you guys up into groups of five to seven, and I want you to discuss one of the following. And when I say discuss, you, you're choosing which one you want to answer. So within that group, like each of you might answer a different question or, or some of you might be answering the same question, but it doesn't have to be one question answered by everyone. Um, so the first uh, option is in your online courses, how are students able to contact you? Number two, how often do you provide students with feedback on their work and what tools do you use to provide this feedback? And number three, how do you create opportunities for students to interact with one another? So make note of the one that you want to answer once I put you in the breakout rooms. Um, and if you have not taught um, an online class yet, maybe you're, you know, you're preparing to, you can answer in terms of like strategies, ideas that you might have, like, you know, for the first one, um, you know, how do you envision your students um, are going to be able to contact you? Um, you know, how, how much are you going to provide feedback? So just you could talk about like your future plans if you have not taught an online course. Um, so just like I said, go ahead and um, jot down the, the question that you want to answer so that you're ready once I open up those breakout rooms. So just give me a second to do that. And how many people? We got 93 people. Okay. And while she's doing that, just want to say that a copy of the slides and a re captioned recording of this webinar will be available on our website in a couple of days.
And as you're waiting for your rooms, I'll also, oh, there you go, it popped up. I'll share that later. Okay. All right, so let's take about 10 minutes, I think, or, um, and then I'll bring you all back. Did it not automatically assign you all? Because I still see everyone in here. Oh, it's not working yet. Let's see. I think you have to assign people. And then yeah, people I thought I clicked people. assign automatically, but maybe I did not. Let me see. I think I just opened your room, so that hopefully that should do it. Did folks get an uh, invitation to join? On. Let me see. Sign. All right, did that work? I think it did, because now I see different people in the rooms. No, oh, people are saying they don't see the invite yet. Hmm. It oh. just came. All right, oh. yay, Thanks. great. Thanks for your patience. People are going in their rooms. Will they be able to see the questions in their breakout rooms? Um, no, that's why I mentioned to like to I, I could broadcast though. I could yeah, broadcast. maybe maybe broadcast that. That's a good idea. Um, let me do that real quick. I can also pause recording briefly. Should I do that? Uh yeah, maybe. All right, I think all the rooms are closed. All right, welcome back. Thank you all for participating. Um, I Let's take like maybe three or four um, people. Um, you can raise your hand and then um, uh, Marina, if you wanna take note of who's raising their hand and they can share out. Just like a major takeaway from that discussion or something you learned, or you might just wanna share you know, what you shared with your group, whatever you prefer. Um, so we'll take a few brave individuals to share out. I am not seeing any hands up. I might have Sorry, I, I was trying to tell you I'll share, but I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, Allison. Okay. Well, I um met with one other person. Her birth name starts with an M. Remind me your name again. Well, anyway, she teaches at Pasadena City College. And um we had a really nice discussion. We didn't have enough time, but um we towards the end we talked about um, the fact that uh, uh, sort of, or she was asking more about um, best practices for creating uh, recorded videos for the asynchronous courses. And so I was sharing with her that, you know, I did almost all, a lot of mine without a lot of time, you know, to try to get everything online. And if I had to do it again, and if I had all the time and energy um, to do so, um, which I've done just a tiny bit on some of my courses, I would re-record and make them more like sort of more intermediate in length, like no longer than 20 minutes. Um, not that any of mine are over an hour, but just make them like I had one that ended up to be like five and a half minutes, like just me being like, you know, explaining something that is really like kind of a main ideas and, um, and and it's something that's shortened to the point, but really gives the students a, a good amount of, you know, really substantive content that they need to understand that particular module. Um, so we were just talking about the way that, and I would do it by hosting a Zoom meeting um, and then uploading it on through 3C Media and then putting it onto my Canvas page. So that was kind of all we really had time to discuss because um, we sort of shared a little bit about ourselves at first. 
Thank you so much, Allison. Uh, I apologize for cutting you all off and not giving you enough time. It's funny because whenever I create these activities, sometimes I'm like, I provide too much time. People are like, oh, we're done talking. And then sometimes it's it's not enough time. I appreciate what you had to share. Um, I think that's a, a, a excellent suggestion. You know, our students' attention span, I mean, generally human beings' attention span is really short. Um, so the longer videos, um, you know, they, they, they tend to get lost in, in some of those videos. So having like shorter videos and maybe interactive um, activities throughout is, is really helpful. So thank you so oh, much. Yeah, yeah, the interactive. And actually a colleague of mine uses Play Pause It and I haven't been able to, you know, have the energy to create all that, but he has a really good Play Pause It system where, and then, and then he gives them other resources that are optional and there's a stop and start and you know and then you can also do like interactive sort of like check up quizzes for fun even or extra credit so I think all those would be really um good and I was just going to add one more thing oh that um I was I was uh, an observer for uh, on the tenure team for one of my colleagues who's very very engaging but I think he made the mistake of making too many super short lectures so I don't know. The students really liked him and like his teaching, but my, envisioning myself as a learner, it was too disjointed because, you know, each little tiny topic within his larger topic was like a four minute lecture. And so I thought that was too disjointed. And then the other thing I'll say about lecture link is that I'm always sort of amazed that my students seem to like praise my lectures, but I personally think that they're like slow and long and, you know, like that they could get to the point and they don't need to be so long. So I think it really, it's, it's all in the eye of the beholder and you can be your own worst critic. Um, but again, I do think a more medium, shorter version with more interaction, like you were saying, would be a, a really best practice. So. Yeah. Thank you, Allison. Yeah, I, I definitely were our worst critics. And then it also has to depend on the type of class, the format, the time of day, if it's an in-person class, right? Teaching a Friday night class, uh, I, I would definitely recommend shorter lectures. Um, but yeah, uh, all of that is is really great. Thank you so much for sharing. And I did see earlier some hands up. I think I believe Nicole Blackwell has her hand up and then Lynn Hill had her hand up, but I think it's not up anymore. So Nicole is uh, still up though. She's next. Go ahead, Nicole. Okay. I wanted to comment really quickly on video lens. So when we first transitioned, I did have some really, really long videos because I presented my videos in the same way I stood before my class. And I could track the analytics and see that they would stop watching about 0.4 or 5 of a 20-minute video. And so I did go back and I realized that I needed to do a script so that I can could make them shorter. And that secondarily, one of the things that was happening is I was very repetitive, right? Because I was trying to reinforce the concepts, but they can rewind it if they want to hear that information again. And so I was able to shorten my videos through scripts and recognizing that they could just revisit it if they wanted to. And I made, and now, so I'm still tracking my analytics and at least more students are getting to the end now. So I'm excited about that. Um, but what I wanted to talk about that my group talked about is toward the end of our discussion, we had a lot of conversation about office hours, right? Trying to rebrand these office hours so that students actually come. I teach asynchronously and on campus and my office hour attendance is pretty consistent between both, almost never. I mean, students don't really participate in my office hours. And so, you know, we, we've talked about how do you rename them? I've heard student hours. And I'm sorry, there was a person in my group. Can you please share what you renamed yours? Because she says she's now getting more, more involvement. Yeah, hi, it's Sherry. Sherry, hi, thank you. Yeah, I, <laughs> this semester I'm teaching in person and online. Um, uh, asynchronous and I rebranded my office hours open instruction and I gave a little blurb about what that means it means every week at this time I'm having open instruction which is a place where I will review the material you can come with your questions but it's a time to get personal direct teaching from me and I've pretty consistently in one class had one or two students every week which is a triumph and in the other one I had like four to six students at first, and then it kind of dropped off. Sometimes it's just me, but it feels better. I don't want to use office hours ever again. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. So I think one of the things I've been thinking about 
about the rebranding the office hours is making them themed just like was just shared. Um, I, I, so I'm just thinking about making them themed. Like I need to be more intentional, right? About every week, having the students looking forward to something specific that they can discuss with me if they choose to come. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, and then let's take one more person if there's another hand up. Yeah, we've got um, Eric Elfkin, his hand is up. All right, go ahead, Eric. So I think we had a really interesting discussion because um, one, one person was talking about being able to tie the discussion to current events. Mm -hmm. And so that would of course get a lot of interest. But then the other person was talking about teaching ESL where the language level can be different. People can be from different places. And there can be so much hesitation with that extra barrier of the language that it can just totally be really difficult to, to get past that. So I think that idea of understanding your students and their specific struggles, I think that's, it just seems really key in that and how you build your, your interaction. Absolutely. I agree. And we're going to talk a little bit about that um, uh, later in the, the webinar. So thank you for, for sharing that, Eric. I appreciate it. Well, thank you all um, for, for sharing your insights. And I hope you were able to learn um, some things from one another. But we will move on. All right. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the instructor to student interaction. Um, and you want to, in your, when you're teaching your online courses, you want to help um, manage student expectations. So students should know not only how they can contact you um, and, and what they can use to contact you, um, and they also need to know when they should expect to hear from you. It's funny because when I've had these discussions around like RSI and, and ensuring that students know that you're going to respond to them and when you're going to respond to them, like a, a lot of instructors have often asked, like, what's an appropriate amount of time? Um, Personally, I feel like saying 24 to 48 hours is appropriate. Um, on the weekends, it could be a little bit longer. Um, but I think the biggest part is letting the students know so they're not like anxious. Like they might email you about their grade or a question about an assignment, and then they're not hearing a response and they don't know when you're going to respond. And now they're like, oh, well, something wrong with my grade or um, so just, you know, at the very least, helping to manage their expectations so they know when they might hear back from you. Um, and then obviously, you know, we we, we want to readily be available to our students and, and respond um, as often as we can. Um, and so there are different ways that you can communicate with your students. Uh, you can provide feedback on their assignments. You can create discussion boards and participate in those discussion boards. We talked about it a little bit earlier. You don't want to just pose a question, but you want to be an active participant. Um, also giving them the opportunity to kind of take a uh, you know, in charge of their development. So you're not like leading the discussions necessarily, um, but just involving yourself, um, creating announcements, uh, using the message students who feature in the grade book. So like you might message students uh, who got a specific grade or message students who missed an assignment um, or, or anything of that sort. You can also utilize the chat. Um, and then office hours, we talked about it, which were, we all may stop calling office hours now. I love that idea. That's awesome. Um, and then um, having different Zoom meetings uh, to whether it's, you know, asynchronous lectures or uh, meetings to to set, set up check-ins with your students. Those are different ways. And there's plenty of others. And I imagine that some of you shared those in your um, breakout rooms as well. Um, all right. And then in terms of uh, student initiated contact, um, you want to make sure that your contact information is easy to find and that it's located in more than one area. Um, and so when students want to contact you, um, you know, they're able to do that um, whenever necessary. And then I, I mentioned this uh, in, in the previous slide, just letting those students how long it'll take you to respond to them. Um, so in the chat, I just want to ask what, uh, and you can answer in the chat, what places might you put your contact info when you're teaching an online class? Front page, home page, the bio syllabus, contact page, home page, welcome letter. I love that. 
homepage orientation letter. orientation module front page. Good. So uh, a lot of you seem to be already utilizing more than one area in your Canvas course. So you mentioned the home page, the syllabus, um, orientation video, um, getting started module. Uh, I, I think a few people said like everywhere. So I would imagine that maybe um, every single page in your Canvas course, you're putting your contact info, which, which is also great. Um, so just so that, you know, Students really like whatever section of the course they're on, they have an opportunity to easily contact you and see where they need to get that information to contact you. Um, some, uh, you know, instructors utilize um, those texting apps. Um, and so they allow students to text them via those apps. Um, sometimes that can be a lot and, you know, it's obviously a personal choice. Um, you know, so you can, you can choose how students are contacting you, but just kind of, again, as I mentioned earlier, managing their expectations. So they know how, and they know when, uh, you will be responding to them. All right. Um, and then I talked a little bit about this earlier. The student to student interaction piece um, is also a big part of RSI. So you want to create opportunities for students to interact with one another. Um, and this really requires you to be intentional about how you design your course, um, because I mentioned this in face to face classrooms. Your students are, you know, they're, they're coming to class maybe a few minutes early. They're talking to each other. They're talking to each other during class. They're talking to each other after class. Um, they might be talking to each other about an exam. I used to always tell my students, like after an exam, I'd always hear them right outside the class when they'd step out, like, oh, this question was so hard. Like, what did you put on this question? And then I would always open the door and tell them, go enjoy your day. Like, you know, don't compare yourself to each other or to, you know, don't fi fixate on a question that you may have gotten wrong. But it's really easy. You don't really have to be intentional about creating that student to student interaction. It often happens naturally. Um, but in an online course, you have to uh, create that interactive learning. Um, and so it's a lot more difficult, but it's just as important. Students uh, tend to learn a lot better when they have opportunities to discuss content with their classmates. So if you are uh, kind of setting up a student to student interaction, um, you know, set up in your Canvas course, I want you to share what ways can you create opportunities for students to interact with each other in online courses as a natural part of the learning experience. So it might be something that you're already doing. Um, go ahead and put your answer in the chat. Questions and answer page. Discussion forums, nice. Peer reviews. Voting for best discussion forum response. I love that. Projects. Pronto. A lot of people using discussion boards. Tracy, I love the idea of dividing them into smaller uh, groups within those discussion boards that top that that often will encourage more engagement because students don't feel like they're buried in the responses. Group projects, discussion lounges, collaborative annotations, love it. Flipped videos, Padlet, Flipgrid. Awesome. So you're all doing like really amazing things. Um, so, you know, you, you've all mentioned different interaction ideas um, using communication tools. Uh, I saw that some of you mentioned prompt, Pronto and, and other ones as well. Um, enab enabling the chat feature um, in your course navigation so students can talk to each other, um, discussion boards. Um, you can even create um, special like interest groups. So like you could create a group, um, get ready for the midterm um, and students can join that or, or different topics um, that might encourage uh, student um, interaction and involvement. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing. And then um, just some other ideas for structured student to student interaction. And like I said, some of these you've all mentioned already, 
um, meaningful discussion assignments, um, communication tools, uh, Pronto, GroupMe, and there's many other ones, um, small group discussions to promote meaningful conversations and connections. So somebody mentioned that. Um, icebreaker activities. I find that, uh, you know, in, in court, whenever I've been on, um, you know, tenure track evaluation committees and I was evaluating an online course, I find that often instructors will only include icebreaker activities icebreaker activities in the beginning of the course, which is also, you know, a really good idea to kind of get that um, beginning, you know, get to know each other kind of structure happening. Um, but I think it's, you know, doing it throughout the course, um, students often appreciate that, and it just gives them more opportunities to get to know each other, um, which will encourage their um, interaction with one another. So, you know, doing it more than just in the beginning of the class. Um, peer review opportunities, some of you may mention that we talked about chat. Um, and then, you know, I also mentioned the special um, interest groups as well. All right, so some strategies to foster um, RSI clearly outline how students can contact and connect with you. So we talked about different areas that you can put that information in your syllabus and the welcome modules and the welcome video and different communication platforms. Um, and then um, also letting them know when you will be responding, creating office hours and posting them throughout the online course um, and in an, um, announcements and just reminding them to attend. And maybe, you know, you can offer different incentives to encourage uh, participation. Um, thinking about creating community forums where students can ask questions about the course. This allows students to, to help one another, first of all. So it's gonna encourage um, interaction. A student might answer a question that another student can answer. And then also when you're responding to some of those questions yourself, it might answer the question that other students might, might have had that same one. So um, just kind of creating forums around uh, those types of discussions as well. And then um, posting frequent announcements in Canvas. And you know I mentioned this in the beginning, you want those announcements to be um, very meaningful, um, specific to happen regularly. So not just like, you know, this assignment is due today. Um, just really, you can you can utilize that opportunity to highlight what's coming in the following week. Um, you might provide general feedback on assign and an assignment. Um, you know, maybe a consistent question is coming up, and so you offer that via the announcements. Um, you might call attention to current events. Someone had mentioned that. Um, and relate that to your course content. Um, and then you also, there's uh, an opportunity to allow students to like or comment on announcements. And that is also a way to engage with students and encourage them to engage with one another. Um, the next one, offering timely, constructive, and detailed feedback on student work. So you don't just want to auto grade quizzes, um, although it's one form of assessment and I'm not saying that you should not engage in it at all. And you can even utilize um, online graded quizzes to come up with, you know, topics like maybe you notice that like 75% of the class got question number three wrong. And so you take that opportunity to create, um, you know, maybe a, a group session where you guys can discuss that question. Um, but, you know, like I said, to meet requirements for RSI, you want to make sure that you're um, including feedback and comments on those uh, graded assignments. Um, and you, like I said, can use the auto, if you want to continue using auto graded assignments to create meaningful feedback um, and, and even discussion boards around that. Um, and then creating and engaging in discussion forums. So uh, allowing students to interact and explore content concepts that they encounter via the lectures and reading. Um, and you don't wanna dominate the discussion, but you want to be present and engaged with students. So you can um, comment on their responses. You can post follow-up questions. Um, to encourage inquiry, you can um, summarize themes that you've, you're finding across multiple replies. Um, and then you can also respond to student ideas um, and just manage the, the discussion overall. Um, and then create and articulate assignment requirements, expectations, and deadlines throughout the course. So this really helps keep your students on track. Um, I know that often the syllabus helps to kind of set that standard. But let's face it, sometimes students aren't reading the syllabus or they're not reading it 
as closely as we'd like them to read it. Um, so, you know, helping keeping students on on track and then also increasing points of interaction between you and the student. And then the last one, um, just trying to schedule uh, regular check-ins with students. And I think making that a normal practice and not, I think often um, instructors will create check-ins for like just students who aren't doing well. And so, so that, you know, that kind of expectation um, might discourage students from meeting with you because they might think like, oh, well, you know, it's only students who aren't doing well or they're not passing the class. Just kind of creating opportunities to check in just generally. Um, you know, it could be about anything within the course. Um, and you can, uh, I think it was actually, I don't remember the person who mentioned um, utilizing Canvas analytics to see like which students aren't participating um, and then how much students are visiting the course. And you're using, you can use that information to then invite them um, to meet with you or meet with other students. All right, I think um, it's really important to think about how you can make your interactions inclusive. And this is just kind of like an extra piece that I'm adding um, you know, to your RSI development. I, it, I think it's especially important in the current higher educational system because I think what we often define as appropriate practices are usually reflections of like white middle-class cultural values. Um, and so these norms are often reflected in broader educational practices and policies. Um, and this includes things like um, course expectations um, or behavior or the way we communicate or how we expect students to communicate and interact. And so with this reality in mind, I think educators really need to recognize that they have um, often like a gap in knowledge around cultural and ethnic uh, uh, backgrounds. And these gaps create disparities in views and expectations that exist between um, faculty and diverse students. So I think for, for California, this is especially important because, um, you know, the California Community College System and even the UC system and the Cal State system um, continue to serve increasingly diverse student demographics. But, um, you know, speaking of the California, California Community College system, um, it really has failed to diversify faculty to mirror that of the student population. I haven't looked at the most updated um, research, but I, I want to say like sometime last summer, I read statistics, it was about 71% of California community college students come from diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds and over 52% um, of the faculty are white. So um, just helping, you know, encouraging better understanding of who our students are. So when I say understanding and recognizing your ignorance and how it could um, impact RSI, just thinking about uh, students' background, their culture, their ethnicity, and how it might influence their differing perspectives and values. And this should really be considered when you're in interacting, interacting with your students and creating standards and expectations. So um, you want to get to know your students. Eric mentioned that, I think someone else had mentioned that. This really will help you shape the type of assignments you create and how you engage with your students. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. When I first started teaching, it's like probably 2015 or 2016, I was teaching a intro to American politics course. And um, we happened to be talking about the Arab Spring. And I don't know how now in hindsight, like we we're comparing that or attaching it to American politics. But I had my students watch this short documentary on the Arab Spring. Um, and it depicted scenes of violence. Um, some of it was like um, grayed out or whatever. And I had told them that. Um, and a this was an in-person class, and uh, after class, a student stayed behind, and he had told me that he's a, a former veteran, and he uh, is uh, suffering through PTSD, and that watching a video that has violence is really going to be triggering and traumatic. I remember being, like, so embarrassed that, like, one, you know, I thought like I obviously didn't do a good job of getting to know my students. Two, I didn't 
offer an alternative because I do think there was benefit in that assignment, but like I should have offered an alternative um, video, like, or maybe more than one video to give students the opportunity to choose what they want to watch. So this is just one example of like, had I known that student better, it would have, it would have better shaped the way that I create assignments um, for my class. And I'm really grateful that that class was in person because I think sometimes in an online form, like students aren't going to email and say like, hey, this is my situation. They will sometimes, but sometimes they won't. And so now they're just choosing not to do the assignment because of what they're going through. So just understanding our students' needs um, and just, you know, making outreach a little bit more personal um, and, and, you know, interactive, just depending on who that student is. The other thing I would recommend is sharing yourself with your students. Um, uh, you know, I did my dissertation on the uh, impact of faculty diversity on student sense of belonging. And one of the things that a lot of the students shared in terms of, you know, a faculty practice that enhances their sense of belonging is, is instructors that interacted with them and spoke about their, their background and who they were and their student experiences. Because a lot of times, you know, what our students go through, we we may have gone through as students. And for them to hear that and to see, oh, like my instructor who's teaching me now also struggle through that is really helpful and it encourages them to engage. Um, and then also be aware of your tone and language and how that might shape student expectations. This came up um, earlier. I don't know who it was. I, I can't remember. I apologize. Who mentioned the ESL classes and, and you know, how information is conveyed. And I absolutely agree with that. Because depending on your student um, population and who is in your class, you might have to provide that information differently. And that's why it's really important to create like opportunities where you're really getting to know your students. You can do surveys. Um, you can ask them, you know, uh, different questions that help you to, to get to know them. Um, because you might, um, you know, convey information in a more like direct or assertive way. Um, or you might convey in a more indirect or, or informal way, depending on like that course expectation. And depending on the student and that student's background, the way they perceive that information is gonna be different, right? They might prefer the more direct assertive or they may prefer the more indirect or you know informal. Um, and then also thinking about the, the language that we use when we create expectations. So, um, you know, to give an example, let's say that you are providing um, directions in, in the form of a question, you, you might say something like, um, can you edit this written assignment to include your analysis? Depending on the student, for some of them, they might read that as an expectation to comply with that request. They have to uh, edit their written assignment to include analysis. But others might say, oh, well, they're just asking it. So like, now I, I have an expectation. There's there's a choice, right? Or it's an option. So really thinking about how we phrase things and including like our students and who they are when we're building out, um, you know, assignments and and different activities. All right. So a few of you mentioned this in the chat and in person that you're use, using using. Uh, the Canvas new analytics. Um, it's an LTI tool that's um, improved analytics for tracking student data. Um, so it provides richer information on things like um, experiences for course grades, weekly online activity, participation, individual student views, um, individual student grades. So you can use analytics to compare course um, average with individual assignments. And by the way, I've hyperlinked um, these uh, different things that you can use the analytics and it provides directions on how to do, you know, each of these different things. So um, when you all get the slides, you'll be able to, to access that. Um, you can view average weekly online participation analytics. You can compare course average weekly online participation um, for individual students or sections. You can send a message to all students or individual students based on specific course grades or criteria. You can view course grades and participation analytics for individual student uh, individual students, and you can view and download reports on missing late 
or excused assignments, class roster, and course activity. These are just a few things that I'm mentioning. You can do a lot more. And so some of you might be thinking like, okay, like what, you know, how is this going to help with, with RSI? So just to give an example, like let's say for the weekly participation, you run the data and you're seeing like, oh, wow, you know, week four, I had so much participation. And then, you know, week five, it went down drastically. Obviously, there are times in the course that we typically see more participation, like typically in the beginning. And then there's a point in the semester, I always say it's like the burnt out point where students are like super tired. We're also super tired. And so there might be less participation and then it might pick up around exam exams, et cetera. But if you're looking at like a specific week and you see there's like a lot of participation in that week, what, what is it that you did in that week? Like what, what kind of assignments, what kind of terminology did you use? How did you interact with your students and kind of replicating that? And then the opposite is also true, right? If you see that like in a week where you expected to have a lot of participation and you didn't, um, and you expected your students to interact more or to participate in the discussions more and they didn't, kind of looking at like your design, right? Like how can you design the, the course differently? How can you design the questions differently to encourage that participation? So having that data um, is really, really useful. And then also just targeting um, different student groups um, to help them succeed in your course, whether you're, you know, it's students who've um, missed uh, assignments or, or, or things like that, and they might need um, like extra support. So it's, just a really awesome tool. And like I said, they have a lot of like YouTube videos. If you haven't utilized um, Canvas analytics, um, it's it's fairly simple. And they have a lot of YouTube videos that you can watch to help you um, kind of do some of these different things if you plan on using it. All right. Um, so I just wanted to share a few more um, RSI resources. And actually, I have some of these up that I can share with you. One second. While Manar is pulling that up, if you haven't already, please take a moment and fill out our survey. I promise it'll only take you about three minutes to complete and it'll help us to improve future offerings. Thank you. Thanks, Nina. All right, can you see the copy of the RSI checklist for instructors? Or do I have the wrong screen share? No, we can see your checklist, you're good. Okay, cool. So this is um, a, a checklist. It's uh, hyperlinked in the more RSI resources slide that I just shared with you all um, that the D our DE team adapted from Diablo Valley and Maricosta Colleges. Um, but it's a really awesome checklist that you can go through um, to help ensure that you are meeting RSI standards and just to help uh, help you engage better with your students and ensure that they're engaging with one another. So it breaks it down um, the start of the course. Um, you can check off like things that you're doing. Um, and then it goes into the instructor to student interaction. There's ideas there um, as well as the student to student interaction. Um, and then a few of you had asked about, or I think it was one person that asked about like other examples. This checklist has some other examples that you can utilize um, that might count towards RSI. But keep in mind, this was uh, recreated for Chafee, but you know, it, it's stuff that applies to almost all colleges. So I felt like it was helpful to share with you all. Um, and then there's also um, the, uh, at one student to student interaction guide. Um, I also hyperlink that so you can use that um, to help um, you uh, encourage student to student interaction. And then there's also a course design rubric um, uh, that helps uh, with, with RSI too. Um, so you can utilize all of these. And then when I, I had mentioned earlier, the uh, Canvas analytics, I hyperlinked all of these, like how do I compare the course average chart graph with an assignment section or student filter? I was gonna drop the links, but I didn't know if that you all get copies of the slides, but since you do, I won't do that. 
um, you'll be able to just access all of these and um, utilize Canvas Analytics if you if you're new to it or you just want to know how to do something specific. Um, I am done. I know we have. Oh, a little sorry, uh, Bernard. There is a question. Um, someone would like a copy of the link that for what you just shared in chat. Would it be possible to drop one? And then we will yeah. also have a copy of everything available on the webinar page once it's all captioned and ready to go. Yeah, which the, is it the page I'm on or the, the checklist? I believe so. This document, uh, are folks wanting a copy of the checklist or the other page that she was on? The checklist. Everyone wants the checklist. So okay. if you want to drop that and then just making sure that it's um, available to view by everybody who gets that link. There you go. Thank you. So if someone can click it and make sure that it is viewable, hopefully it is. We click it. Yep, I can view it. So it should be okay for folks to view it. And I see lots of people are, are on it now too. All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here, for participating. I always learn so much when you know I, I facilitate any any type of these presentations. I really appreciate it. I love totally going to take that idea for the office hours. Um, so <laughs> uh, I, I, again, thank you. I really enjoyed my time here with you all. Um, and yeah, thanks for coming and, you know, don't forget to fill out the survey as Marina mentioned. Yes. Thank you all. This was amazing. I really appreciate it. And as I mentioned, we'll have a copy of Manar's slides and a recorded caption copy of this video available on our webinar website. And just a quick plug, we do have four more webinars next week. Um, there's one on using AI for course mapping. There's two on accessibility and captioning. There's some really good stuff, one on the student support hub. So um, our webinars are wrapping up in the next couple of weeks. So please take advantage of them. They are free. And I hope that you found this beneficial. And of course, please complete that survey. We do want your feedback and we want to hear about other topics that you're interested in as well for the future. So please take a moment and um, let's go ahead and give Monar a, a virtual uh, applause and thank you very much. I hope you all have a great day. Thank you for your time today. Lots of clapping emojis there. I'm gonna stop recording now. Uh, Marina, I, I saw a few people ask 